Okay, so today we will start a new chapter. Um, it is about eukaryotic transcription and transcription regulation. It is primarily eukaryotic, but I will give you some initial primer with prokaryotes, some typical examples. Uh, and what we will learn there will be valid even for the for our understanding of eukaryotic transcription. So uh, what we will be uh, focusing on is a very fundamental thing. What is transcription? Okay. Transcription is a polymerization reaction of ribonucleotide triphosphate. Okay. Poly a polymer of ribonucleotide triphosphate is called an RNA. Okay. Uh, but this in the cell, the synthesis of RNA is always template dependent. Uh, transcription is when DNA is the template and RNA is made, uh, you know, uh, reading it. So using DNA as a, so it is called DNA dependent RNA polymerization. That is transcription. The I will come to the regulation part in a minute. So there are some fundamental questions that can be asked that, you know, like, uh, uh, how do you know if a particular RNA is present in a cell or a tissue? We already have learned some of the techniques, Northern uh, PCR, RT-PCR, qPCR, uh, RNA in situ hybridization, etc. Those are the standard techniques. How would you know that if an RNA is present in the cell, uh, how would you know that it is actually being transcribed right now, or it is uh, it was transcribed and still present? Half life is long, so it is still present. So uh, for that, you need to look at uh, the actual nucleus where in eukaryotes, actual nucleus where the transcription happens. Uh, so it is called nuclear runoff transcription that uh, you know it is actually uh, happening in there <clears throat> and then uh, comes the rate when we will get into eukaryotic transcription i will get into it much uh, in much more detail but the way i look at it you, know, you can develop your own philosophy uh, that's not a problem the way I look at it is regulation of transcription is purely a rate issue. How is it a rate issue? That where it is not being transcribed, there it is being transcribed at a very low rate that is not even perceptible. Somewhere it is being transcribed at a modest rate, somewhere it is being transcribed at a very high rate. So therefore, it can be, you know, temporal that an RNA is not transcribed when the cell is in one state and the RNA is transcribed when the cell is in another state. Okay, like uh, it can be with respect to heat, uh, physical forces, signal uh, ligands or whatever. So all of these are basically in my book, these are all rate issues that when there is no ligand, the rate of transcription is very low, imperceptible, not detectable. When there is a ligand, the rate of transcription is very high. So that, that's how it is. Um, the other issue that often you, you will encounter is that uh, how, what is the half-life of the RNA? Is it too short? Is it long? Or is it moderate? That also, uh, you know, is part of the regulatory processes. Like uh, whether you are talking about bacteria or yeast or humans or whatever, okay? the total number of RNA transcripts that any of the cell types can make, if that is the superset okay every rna that can post transcribe in a cell if you call that a superset in the 
in a particular situation, only a subset of that is transcribed. Now, regulation is about which subset will be transcribed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's what brings us to specialized transcription, cell type specific transcription, condition specific transcription, because there will always be some RNA that are always being transcribed, like the RNA for actin, tubulin, ribosomal RNA, or uh, you know, uh, some of these, which we call housekeeping function uh, genes. Their RNA are always being transcribed. Well, some will be transcribed only under certain conditions. The cell changes its fate, you know, like we will learn about differentiation process, or when there is a presence of signaling ligand, or, you know, there is change in mechanical environment, etc. So these genes, they are transcribed when there is a need. And this need is conveyed by an extrinsic factor. It can be physical or it can be chemical. Okay. Like I'm saying mostly signaling molecules because mostly it is chemical. Okay. But there can be physical uh, forces as well. Okay. Uh, mechanoregulation of transcription is very well uh, studied area. Okay. So that the need is conveyed to the cell by extrinsic factors. Therefore, uh, you know the the process that is upstream of transcription, that is application of the physical forces, changing the temperature. Uh, and like presence or uh, absence of a signal transduction ligand or a toxin or something like that. Those are proactive processes, meaning they happen, they're the instigator. And the transcription that happens because of that, that is a reactive process. Like it, the cell responds to the uh, extrinsic factor and responds by changing the transcriptional uh, activity. Okay. So these are just you know, like uh, some of the basic concepts that we will visit many times uh, throughout this chapter. Okay. First, you know, let us understand some very interesting transcription regulation, uh, just three examples. We are not going to get into the detail. So here, what you are looking at are certain uh, um, genes whose mutations, these are all transcription factors. Um, again, I will repeat it multiple times. When I say transcription factor, I mean something very special. There are a set of proteins that are required for any transcription to happen. There are a set of proteins that are required for any transcription to happen. Those are Generally, in eukaryotes, particularly, those are referred to as general transcription factors. In bacteria, also those are present, uh, and you will see those. And then there are certain protein factors that dictate temporal or spatial regulation of transcription, meaning whether a particular RNA will be transcribed at a particular time or a particular place in the organism, etc. Et so those are specific transcription factors, but colloquially, those are the ones that are referred to as transcription factors. The others are referred to as general transcription factors. So whenever I say transcription factor, I mean the condition specific transcription factors, okay? So PAX6 is one such transcription factor. If you have mutation in the gene, there will be uh, defects in the eye, you know, like the eyelashes will be not there, eye size will be small, and uh, there are any changes. A fantastic example is a, a gene called ultra bithorax, okay, or UBX. So you see that in Drosophila, there are these wings and there are these tiny organelles called halter, okay. It is spelled as H A L T E R D. When UBX is mutated, the halter also becomes like another wing. So you can 
imagine that when ubx is present it imposes the fate of halter on what could have been <coughs> another wing but if ubx is not present ultra bisorax is not present then that imposition is gone now <coughs> the wing of course will develop as wing and what is what would, should have been halter also develops as a, as a wing Okay. Um, there are transcription factors in plants you know, that can make a flower look like a leaf and uh, vice versa. So uh, you know, I will share with you some very classic experiments. So TBX5 and TBX4, please look at it. TBX5 is expressed only in the wing bud and TBX4 is expressed only in the leg bud. Okay. TBX5 is not present in leg, TBX4 is not present in wing. And this is, of course, whole mount RNA in situ hybridization that you were looking at. Now, when you talk of very early stage embryos, then the entire flank, meaning the actual body axis, the entire flank uh, in a certain region is capable of giving rise to a limb bud, meaning from where a limb can form, capable of. So this is called when this entire region that is capable of giving rise to a limb bud, this entire region is therefore called competent to form limb bud, competent, okay? But that doesn't mean that you actually form limb buds from everywhere there is an instigator for forming the limb bud, which is a signaling molecule called FTF, okay? Uh, the very long, uh, like very elaborate uh, mechanism, I'm not going to get in there. I'm just going to get straight to the point. That it was shown by scientists that if you, FGF is a signaling molecule, it's a ligand for a signaling pathway called fibroblast growth factor. Do not uh, try to get meaning out of the name. These names are mostly historical, that in which context they were first discovered, okay? So FGF, there are many FGFs, FGF4 or FGF8 or FGF10. If you take an, most often the uh, FGF that has been used is FGF8. If you put a bead of FGF8 anywhere in this zone of competence, you can form a extra limb bud there, supernumerary limb bud. Normally there will be one here, one here, and it will, it will form an extra limb bud. Sorry, the, the, the zone of competence is broader. Yeah. Sorry. Now, now, when you are forming an extra bud, will that extra bud develop as a wing or as a leg? It's an interesting question, right? That, <coughs> There are naturally two limb buds, one that is a wing bud that will form the wing, one that is the leg bud that will form the leg. Closer to the head is wing bud, closer to the tail is leg bud. But when you are forming this supernumerary wing, uh, bud, what will be its character, wing-like or leg-like? And it has been shown that if you do it closer to the wing bud, then it will be a, uh, wing bud, the supernumerary one will be a wing bud. But if you do that, if you induce an extra bud with FGF and put, you know, like a TBX5 in there, like you make sure that this extra bud expresses TBX5, then that extra bud will develop like a wing. But the supernumerary bud, if you artificially express TBX4, then it is no longer a wing bud, rather it's a leg. So just because you are doing closer to the wing bud, the supernumerary bud will express TBX5, just like the natural one, and it will form a wing bud. But you again put the bit close to the leg, uh, wing bud, but this time you override the information 
that is dictated by FGA5 by over expressing TBX4. Now it superposes TBX4's function on TBX5 zone and then converts what would have been a wing bud into a leg bud. So, you know, these are transcription factors, therefore, which can actually impose fate, whether it is the halter or whether it is a TBX4 or TBX5. Okay? So, therefore, the specialized transcription factors, or which we call transcription factors, they play a very critical role in uh, any animal physiology. Okay? Now, you know, like, uh, to understand how transcription factors work, which is the ultimate objective of this chapter. It's a, a long discussion that we will have. Uh, let us first understand how transcription happens. So there is this <coughs> DNA element called promoter, which is a fixed distance away from the transcription start site okay, that is shown here. Now let us get it straight. Promoter is the sequence to which RNA polymerase is recruited. Okay? There is no other definition. Promoter is the sequence to which RNA polymerase is recruited. And after recruitment, at the time of recruitment, uh, the DNA is still double helix in there and it is you know, like a, called a, a closed complex. The moment the RNA polymerase start to move, there are lots of ATP that is required huh, for it to move and also to melt the DNA. So the DNA is now uh, melted and it, uh, the strands are separated. Therefore, this is called an open complex. Then once the open complex is formed, often cases the, the RNA polymerase will uh, start the transcription, fall off, to start again, fall off, and it will go on several times, but eventually it will start to move. And even when it is falling off, these are called futile uh, uh, rounds of initiation, even then it will actually polymerize uh, RNTPs, okay? So after forming the open complex, the RNTP uh, polymerization starts, and then it goes into the elongation mode. After a few rounds of futile transcription, it will go into the elongation mode and eventually it will hit a region that will signal that transcription should be stopped. Okay? And then RNA polymerase falls off, RNA separates from the DNA, transcription is complete. The whole thing is about where the transcription will start from. Okay? Will so this is this is to be understood in multiple levels the question is simple where will transcription start from you will say that that is you know next to the promoter sequence and you will be correct okay but you think of your skin and your bone do you think all the mRNAs that are made in the skin are also made in the bone? The answer is obviously no. But this DNA sequence, the promoter sequence is there. The, every cell in your body has the same genome. Therefore, the promoter sequence is there everywhere. RNA polymerase is there in every cell. So why is it that certain transcripts can only be made in skin and not in bone, and certain transcripts can only be made in bone and not in skin, though promoter is there and RNA polymerase is there. Uh, how is it determined where it will stop? So transcription is precisely that, the process that dictates from where transcription will st start, from where it will stop, in which cell it will uh, uh, happen and in which cell it will not happen at what time it will happen, at what time it should not happen. That's all that is there to learn about transcription and transcriptional regulation. There are thousands of laboratories around the world that are only studying these fundamental questions. That is an mRNA transcribed in this cell? If it is, where does it start? 
Where does it end? Why is it transcribed in that cell and not in other cell? These are the kinds of questions that are being asked by thousands of laboratories. So to understand these issues, uh, like these concepts properly, we will uh, you know, learn transcription first in prokaryotes, you know, very superficially, and then in much more depth in eukaryotes. So this is a bacterial RNA polymerase, a very large protein complex of five subunits. There are two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and there will be a sigma subunit. The sigma subunit is there only for starting the transcription. After that, it falls off. The elongating RNA polymerase is not supposed to have the sigma subunit, okay? But it's a very large complex and it crawls on the DNA. And during the process of crawling, it introduces a kink in the DNA, okay? And because of that kink, the DNA opens up and RNA forms and comes out of that tunnel, okay? So now let us look at some very fundamental issues. This I have told you earlier, but I'm telling you again. Let us consider the enzymes that are required for making tryptophan in a cell. In bacteria, it is in an operon. The proteins that will make tryptophan, uh, tryptophan biosynthesis enzyme E, D, C, D, A are all present in a cluster. It will be transcribed as one RNA, a polycystronic RNA, poly. Cistron is what you call what if, okay? A polycystronic RNA, and from there, all the five proteins will be made, okay? So, if the cell is permitted to make this polycystronic RNA for tryptophanyl biosynthesis, then all the tryptophanyl biosynthetic proteins will be made. But in eukaryotes, as I explained to you earlier, Polycystronic RNA is not made, okay? The monocystronic RNA is like, the, actually we do not call them cystron. We say one uh, gene, like uh, individual genes are transcribed and they are distributed over four chromosomes. So not only that they are not in a cluster, they are in four chromosomes. Trip one uh, and trip four is on chromosome four and then uh, chromosome five, chromosome seven, chromosome 11. Now, each of these RNAs will be separately transcribed, they will be separately translated, and they will make the five proteins. Now, you may say that the bacterial system is much more, you know, uh, intelligent system. Why? Because either you need to, to, to make tryptophan, or you don't need to make tryptophan. Yeah, or you don't need to make tryptophan. If you need to make tryptophan, you need all the proteins simultaneously. So if there is just one control and command center, and that dictates, you know, a polysyn production of a polycystronic RNA, and from there all the different uh, proteins are made, so then you do not need uh, complex regulation. While in here, the five genes are to be transcribed separately. But for tryptophan to be synthesized, all the five will have to be transcribed at the same time, transcribed and translated at the same time. Like if you do not have any one of the five enzymes, you will not be able to make tryptophan. So then what is the advantage of having the five genes under completely different kinds of controls? In reality, they might have similarities in control mechanism, but that similarity had to be invented five times over. Right? Here you have to have only one common control center. Here you have to have five. So it had to be developed five times over that exactly the same kind of regulation is there. So then what is the advantage? Why did we need to do that uh, in uh, eukaryotes or more complex organisms? The answer is perhaps this that I will explain to you later again, that 
we as of today we know that the five enzymes of tryptophan biosynthesis they are only involved in tryptophan biosynthesis that's what we know as of today is it at all possible that some of these enzymes can take part in some other cellular pathways maybe some other biosynthetic pathway or maybe as a signaling molecule maybe as a transcription factor hmm. such examples are there okay like uh, many of you have heard of this gene protein called gap dh glycerol dehyde phosphate dehydrogenase glycerol dehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase now this is a protein that is expected to be produced in every cell it is one of the most common control gene that we use for all sorts of studies and uh, it's called a housekeeping gene but the fact is that gap dh an enzyme can also act as a transcription factor there is a very famous transcription factor called ngrel it's a repressor there have been examples where ngrel can act as a signal transduction molecule okay. so originally when these particularly the enzymes when they were identified the way they were identified is this that scientists know that you know like uh, if there are certain raw material certain st starting components then tryptophan can be made in the cell to know which enzymes make tryptophan what you would do is you will take the starting material and because bacteria or yeast can make tryptophan so you can expect that in their cytosol they will have the enzymes for making it you make an extract of the cytosol add it to the uh, starting material and see if tryptophan is being made if it is made then you know that that all the enzymes are there then you start to fractionate them and eventually you purify all the different proteins and you can identify them for protein sequencing etc now you see the way it is designed is to discover the protein or proteins that are necessary to make tryptophan thus can you rule out the possibility that the proteins that you have identified albeit they can make tryptophan but they cannot do something else this could not be done you can never rule out you can you generally whether you are using genetics or biochemistry you are expecting a particular function for a gene or a protein and you discover it and you are happy most of the time we do not try to discover if that gene or protein has some other functions unless you have some compelling reasons by accident scientists have found out that the same protein has some other function this is referred to as moonlighting activity moonlighting is a english word that generally means that a cameo appears you know like uh, something else you know, like you do uh, like uh, in normal life you are not sir sometimes you moonlight as a cricketer okay it is like that so one possibility is that in eukaryotes due to much more complex physiology but our gene number of genes have not gone up that significantly right if you compare to the number of genes in e coli and compare to the number of genes in a human it has not gone up that much so therefore to support this complex behavior it is possible that the same protein has evolved to have multiple different functions and therefore there might be a function for which you only need trip 5 you do not need the other trip enzymes in this model if you only need trip 5 you will still have to transcribe the whole thing transcribe and translate the whole uh, operon but in eukaryotes 
you can because your regulation is independent you can only make trip five maybe the trigger then if you remember the extrinsic factor the need with the trigger then will be different from that of low level of trip trip something else will be the trigger but you can potentially then have a specialized role for one of these enzymes which would not have been possible in an operon set right so that's why you know like uh, perhaps in your career you see um you don't see polycystonic rna you see individual genes are being transcribed in it now as i said that some genes are transcribed at the same level all the time the housekeeping but some genes like the proteins that are needed to make tryptophan the enzymes for tryptophan biosynthesis you do not need to make them all the time you need to make them only when the level of tryptophan in the cell is low either you are not supplying it from the medium or something else okay. therefore that has to be that has to be made possible in the cell and this can be made possible in one of two ways one way is that unless otherwise instructed the cell will always make the rna and the protein like you know some of you students unless otherwise instructed you will uh, play video games with your mobile phone all day okay there has to be a trigger to stop you pl from playing video game like the quiz is coming up so in this case that is how it is that the default is transcription of the whole operon and making all the proteins but if the level of tryptophan is very high inside the cell then you don't need to make it you know like uh, the uh, the cells are very very energy efficient uh, environment so if you don't need to make it don't make it so then there is this protein called tryptophan depressor it is produced from another region of the chromosome and then if the tryptophan level is high then it will bind to the repressor and only then the repressor will be active and will come and sit on the operator okay operator is a dna element apart from the promoter promoter is where the rna pole will bind to operator will dictate whether the rna pole will be allowed to transcribe or not okay so if the repressor sits on the operator then there is a physical block then your rna pole will not be able to move through it so that is one kind of a regulation it is called repress repress serial operator that is the operon status normally is always on unless there is very high level of tryptophan therefore the transcription goes down it's a repress serial operator okay now <clears throat> for tryptophan just having this operator is not good enough there is another level of regulation which makes it even more tight that if there is high tryptophan there will be absolutely no biosynthesis of the no, no synthesis or transcription translation of the tryptophan by synthetic enzymes and if there is low tryptophan then it will be uh, produced in a lot of time so that mechanism is imparted by what is called a leader sequence tryptophan leader and within that there is a specialized dna element called the attenuator attenuation matlab to reduce okay an attenuator is there we will see what the attenuator is and what the trip leader is etc so this what is this leader sequence is that even before you know somewhere here the polycystron will start you know e d b e g c d a they will start here even before that there is a proper reading frame there is a start site and there is a stop site okay. it is a 14 nucleotide 14 amino acid long open reading frame 
Very interestingly, though it is only 14 amino acids, in a stretch, number two, there are two tryptophan codons. Two tryptophan codons. Now, for tryptophan, if you check your uh, codon table, there is only one codon for tryptophan. Therefore, the uh, supply of tRNA for making tryptophan, for, for uh, carrying tryptophan, is low to begin with. Because there is only one type, the, uh, there is only one codon. And generally speaking, tryptophan is not a, one of the most abundant amino acid in proteins. Therefore, but you have two tryptophan cells here, two tryptophan codons in number two. Therefore, when the cell has low level of tryptophan, the ribosome will not be able to cross this region too. Why? Because there is no tryptophan tRNA in the tRNA supply. If there is no supply, ribosome will stall there. The other issue is that these regions, one and two, they can be spared with each other. Two and three, they can be spared with each other. Three and four, they can be spared with each other. Intramolecular uh, be sparing, so you can call them loops, stem and loops. Okay? So if the level of tryptophan is low, the ribosome will stall here, precluding a stem and loop formation between one and two. And because two is not available, and three has the ability to be spared with four as well, so this will be the prominent uh, RNA secondary structure. Now, if this is the RNA secondary structure, then right after that, there are polyleaves. So this RNA will fall off. So the RNA polymerase is somewhere over here. You know, it is showing RNA polymerase is somewhere over here. RNA polymerase so RNA polymerase moves first, and because we are talking about bacteria, where co-transcriptional translation happens, meaning translation starts even before the mRNA synthesis, the RNA synthesis is complete. In eukaryotes, you cannot have it because transcription happens in the nucleus, translation happens in the cytosol. So after transcription, the RNA has to be carried to the cytosol for it to be translated. But in eukaryotes, in prokaryotes, they happen simultaneously. So the RNA is moving only here, and the ribosome is only a few dozens of bases away from it. But if it stalls here, this particular secondary structure forms, and RNA polymerase has already formed this. So this stretch of this, this signature, a stem and loop, followed by polyhu is what is called the transcriptional terminator. So this is a natural feature in DNA that will be replicated in the RNA because you know, transcription is DNA template driven. And this stretch of polyhu will not be sufficient to hold on to the RNA to the double helix. So it will fall off the the ribosome will uh, uh, fall off along with it, the polymerase will fall off. Okay? So this is a method of transcription termination in prokaryotes normally. The trip leader actually facilitates that kind of trans transcriptional termination. But if the tryptophan level is uh, sorry, if the tryptophan level is if the tryptophan level is high, then you know the ribosome will be able to move through this two, and then three, four will be able to uh, base pair, and then it will. But if the tryptophan level is low, then the ribosome will stall here because it does not have the tryptophan tRNA, and then this two three loop will form. Then this terminator signature will not be there because the poly U is after four. So the terminator signature will not be there and transcription will continue to happen. So if you want, I would strongly recommend that you watch this video and it has very nice animation and explanation how to uh, leader sequence work. Okay? And this leader sequence is a feature of 
many different operons. And typically speaking, in the leader sequence, you will have the codons for the particular amino acid that, like if it is an uh, amino acid operon, uh, bisynthetic operon, whichever amino acid is to be made by the operon, the leader sequence will have codons for that particular amino acid. Lack operon, on the other hand, is a inducible operon. Okay. What does it mean? That in trip operon, the default state is on. When tryptophan level is high, it is turned off. So that's why it is reversible. In lack operon, the default state is off. When there is lactose in the medium and not glucose or you know low level of glucose, then only this operon is turned on. Okay, so this is an inducible operon. Now you see that whether it is uh, this case, think about it. How does why is it that the trip repressor binds to tryptophan only when the concentration is high? Why does it not bind to tryptophan when the concentration is low? That is something that is dictated by KD, dissociation constant. If the dissociation constant is very, very high, then uh, yeah, if the dissociation constant is very, very high, then the then the dissociated state is the more favored state. If the dissociation constant is low, then the associated state is the more favored state. So it is basically dictated by affinity. What is the affinity of the repressor to the to tryptophan? If the affinity was very high, then even at a low concentration of tryptophan, it will bind to the repressor. But as evolution has dictated, the affinity for, for tryptophan for this, towards this repressor is very low. Therefore, tryptophan can stay be associated with it only when the cellular tryptophan concentration is very high. The same is the case with uh, this uh, promoter for lack of it. The lack operon has a weak promoter. You know, imagine that, like if you remember, in uh, bacterial expression vector, an artificial promoter is used called TAC. It's the fusion of tryptophan and lack uh, promoter, right? Tryptophan is an Repressible operon, meaning the default is transcription will be on. Therefore, the prime for the promoter must be a strong promoter. A strong promoter simply means that RNA polymerase will be stably recruited to it. Okay. Like uh, if RNA polymerase binds, falls off, binds, falls off, then transcription will not happen, right? Uh, so if you can reduce the falling off of RNA polymerase then transcription will happen at a higher rate, right? So if you want to reduce the falling off, then you have to ensure that the sequence of the promoter is such that it can bind to the RNA polymerase very tightly. So the closer, the, the, if the sequence of the particular promoter that you were talking about is closer to the consensus, then RNA polymerase will bind stability to it, which is the case with the tryptophan operon. But here, 
you don't want transcription to happen. The normal state is, the default state is no transcription. So therefore, the promoter is weak inherently. When you want, you can rapidly ramp it up because it's an inducible promoter. And that is done by the operator. So there are two players here, a catabolic activation protein binding site, it's called CAP, catabolic activation protein. Sometimes it, it is also called cyclic AMP binding protein. And then there is a promoter and then there is an operator. So these are the two specialized elements, regulatory elements. The promoter is simple, where RNA polymerase will bind to. Now, if there is no lactose and the cyclic AMP level is low, okay, because there is some glucose in it in the system, then this cap cannot bind to the cap site and the lac repressor is bound to the operator. Because it is bound to the operator, the RNA pole cannot move through. Therefore, there is no transcription. Okay? But if there is glucose, so low CMP level, but there is also some lactose, then that lactose will bind to the lac repressor and will remove it from the operator. Now RNA polymerase can go through it. So some transcription will happen. But remember that there is some, some glucose in the system as well. So it's a low cyclic AMP setting. When there is no glucose and only lactose, then not only the repressor is off the reporter or off the operator, but also cyclic AMP bound cap protein is now recruited to the cap site. And that this cyclic AMP bound cap protein and interact with the RNA polymerase. So though the intrinsic affinity of RNA polymerase in lac operator, lac promoter, the intrinsic affinity of the RNA polymerase to the promoter is low. But because of the binding of the cap protein nearby and because RNA polymerase can interact with it, therefore the apparent affinity of RNA polymerase towards the promoter goes up. Okay. So that way you get a rapid increase in transcription level of the lac operon when there is only lactose and no glucose. Okay. Because there is no glucose, cyclic AMP level is high. And because cyclic AMP level is high, cap protein is bound to the cap site, which in turn through its interaction with RNA polymerase, recruits it to the lac promoter, and then transcription happens. Okay? So there are many uh, sigma factors you know, like that are there. I, I told you that sigma factors uh, generally will be associated only during the promoter clearance, okay? Like uh, recruitment of the RNA polymerase to the promoter and promoter clearance. Once the promoter clearance happens, then sigma factor falls off. And there are multiple different kinds of sigma factors depending on which gene it is. And you see that the promoter sequence, there are bipartite promoter sequence, minus chain sequence, minus cytokine sequence, they vary depending on which gene it is and which kind of sigma factor it utilizes, the promoter sequence can vary. Okay, simply because the, the protein sequences are different between LAC70 and LAC uh, S or LAC32, the protein sequences are different. So they, they will clearly, they cannot have the all different kinds of sigma factors, cannot have the same affinity towards, you know, like uh, one particular promoter sequence. So therefore, to offer the optimal binding, the promoter sequences are varying as well. Then there is another interesting thing. 
this is the last one that I will talk about, and uh, after that uh, we'll stop. See, for um, nitrogen metabolism, yeah, glutamine, like glutamine biosynthesis. For nitrogen metabolism, those genes use a special kind of a sigma factor called sigma 54. Okay, and it has its own binding site. That RNA polymerase, sigma 54 bound RNA polymerase, has its own binding site. And there is another sequence which is called enhancer. We will talk a whole lot more about it when we are talking about promoter. But enhancer is a feature that is there in some bacterial genes, but is there for almost every eukaryotic genes that I know of. There is another protein called NTRC. NTRC can bind to the DNA only when it is uh, phosphorylated. Okay? And NTRC bound, like uh, DNA bound NTRC can interact with the sigma 54 RNA polymerase, you see. So that's how this NTRC can increase the rate of recruitment of RNA polymerase to its promoter. So here also, intrinsically, the affinity of the RNA polymerase to the promoter will be low. But because NTRC is bound to it, and it can interact with the RNA polymerase, so it will bring it to the vicinity of the promoter, and you know, the, through this kind of uh, stem and loop formation, and then transcription rate will go up. How does this work? Very, very elegant manner. So there are two components, okay? There's not one component, there are two components. You saw only this part which was bound to the DNA. There is another one called NTRB. In eukaryotes, the phosphorylations are mostly on serine, threonine, or tyrosine. In bacteria, there are lots of examples of histidine kinases, which gets phosphorylated on the histidine recipe. So this NTRB, or you know, even in generic case, it will have two domains. Okay? One domain is the histidine kinase transmitted domain. You will understand why it is transmitted. Histidine kinase transmitted domain. The other domain is sensor domain. Sensor. It senses the chemical composition. So when there is very high glutamine concentration, then again the same issue that the affinity between glutamine and NTRB is low. Okay, so normally it will not bind, but if there is very high glutamine, then it will bind to it. And if it is bound, then the NTRB his kinase, his kinase, kinase is inactive. It cannot phosphorylate NTRC. But if glutamine concentration goes down, not zero, it goes going down. But because this affinity is low, this is sensor, right? Sensor's job is only to sense. So if the affinity is low and it is empty, this pocket is empty, then the histidine kinase becomes active. It gets phosphorylated, and this phosphorylated histidine then phosphorylates the aspartic acid in NTRC. Now it is phosphorylated NTRC, which will go and bind to the DNA and it, in the enhancer region, okay, here, in the enhancer region. And because it is bound, it will then interact with RNA polymerase and will recruit it there, and then transcription will happen. So this is how, you know, like a almost eukaryotic like manner. Uh, transcription can be uh, controlled in prokaryotes. And this is not just true for glutamine uh, biosynthetic uh, pathway enzymes. The, this kind of sensing uh, works for multiple different bacterial uh, pathways. Always there will be a sensor domain which will bind to a chemical either when, uh, depending on the particular relationship and particular regulation, it can be either that at a very high concentration, it will remain bound when the protein is inactive. At a low concentration, it will not remain bound when the protein is active. Or 
the unbound form is inactive and only when it is bound to its uh, chemical which for which it is the sensor it becomes active so both variants are there okay so that's all that i wanted to talk about today so i gave you some ideas about transcription and proprietary transcription transcriptional regulation etc in the next lecture we will enter eukaryotic transcription okay so please read this uh, like listen to this lecture multiple times so that you are familiar with the concepts because eukaryotic transcription is basically these concepts only with a whole lot more complexity okay so thank you